Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot known locally as the February Room is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. Today's guest has been interviewed by Lester Holt, is the front man for a ghost tribute band, holds certificates that allow him to launch rockets into space, is a master electrician and a certified scuba instructor. Though he probably doesn't even own a fly rod, he spends his fair share of time in the water. This guy fishes for evidence in order to solve missing persons cases, and we think you'll find his story compelling and inspirational. Nick Rattlesnake Wren, welcome to the show. Thank you, Justin. Thank you for having me. You bet, buddy. Um, how you doing, man? Uh, we have uh, we've uh, known each other our entire lives, but don't get to see each other much anymore. So, um, so what's new? Oh, <clears throat> you know, not much. It's good to see you. Um, yeah, just got back from the coast yesterday. I was in Newport for uh, about four days. Kind of spent Thanksgiving there and the following few days to do a little. Uh, scuba diving and some sightseeing and also doing some filming for my YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, we had a lot of, a lot of fun there. And um, those videos that we filmed will <clears throat> probably come out here in the next couple of weeks. Um, of course, <clears throat> right when we finished filming for the day yesterday and uh, I was leaving, I had to stop at the gas station on the way out of town. Um, I don't know if you if you remember Newport that much, but there's a circle K basically right at the corner of the highway that heads west from there to come back home. And I pulled in to get some gas and was getting up, getting gas filled up. And so I w- ran inside to get a five hour energy drink and uh, set it up at the counter. And I was like, Oh man, maybe I should get a glass of, get a bottle of water as well. So I s- grabbed my five hour energy and I walked back over to the glass case and I grab a bottle of water out of there. And while this is going on, I hear kind of some stuff going on around me and a little bit of swearing and I look over and it appeared that this like homeless dude had basically come barging in and he was cutting in front of the line to use the restroom and the the female cashier didn't didn't really like that and she was yelling at him to you know hey you can't just cut the line here you got to wait in line and of course he was kind of I don't know if he was belligerent or what but he was very rude to her and he started um, pushing his way past her and as the guy that was in the restroom started to come out um, he barged his way in there and she followed him in saying hey you need to get out of here and he was carrying this like two inch in diameter kind of walking stick thing and um, all of a sudden as I looked over I see him grab this thing and start clubbing her on the back so what is going on here and so after he hit her once in the back basically it kind of pushed her out the door and he barged his way in and locked the door. And I looked at the guy behind the counter. I said, Hey, call nine one one. You got an issue going on here. And so he gets on the phone, he's calling nine one one and I'm kind of pacing around the store trying to figure out what to do here. Cause I didn't want to leave the area until the cops got there. Cause there's some guy on the loose in the store now locked in the bathroom with a club and he's, you know, potentially, beating on people with it so after about a minute there the guy had the, the cops on 911 call you know to get them in route and they're still not there so the door opened up and he comes barging out and uh he's trying to make his way towards the front of course this lady is really angry with him at this point and she's getting in his face saying hey you need to we're the cops are coming you need to hold up and he kind of drops his sleeping bag and starts hitting on her again and so about that time I 
I had been kind of pacing around the store, getting more angry and more angry. So I ran around. He kind of brought her to the ground, and he had his he had her head kind of locked in his lap. And uh, and I said, and he's looking up, and he had the audacity to look around to these other bystanders and said, "Hey, can somebody uh, assist me here?" And I'm thinking, I don't doesn't even make any sense, like what you're doing. So in my mind, I'm like, yeah. I'm gonna assist you, all right. So I walked around behind the aisle where he couldn't see me, and I came up behind him, and as fast as I could, I just grabbed him underneath the arm and yanked him off him, yanked him off her, and kind of tackled him in the aisle. And about that time, another guy came in from outside too, and we both were basically on top of this guy. And the guy that came in from outside kind of grabbed him in an arm lock, and I grabbed his uh, left arm and pinned it to the ground. And she was able to get up. She was okay. There was a bunch of people kind of standing around, like, "What the hell's going on?" And so um, I just yelled, Is the, "Are the cops on the way?" And they said, "Yeah, they they should be here soon." So we just basically looked at the guy. He's trying to tell us to, "Hey, can you get off me? You relieve some of the pressure." And the guy next to me said, "You're lucky. I don't break your arm. You ain't going nowhere." So we basically just pinned this guy down and held him for about another minute till the cops were able to come. So it was basically like a citizen's arrest on some some uh, dude off the streets had decided that um, he was going to beat his way into the bathroom to use the bathroom, and it didn't really pan out too well for him. So anyway, we held him before, until the cops got there. They got him out of there, arrested him, got our story. The lady was okay. Um, luckily, it didn't go any worse, but that was basically how I ended my trip to the coast yesterday. Wow, man, that's some vigilante shit. Uh, yeah, I don't know what. Was... Uh, yeah, I don't know what's the most um, the most impressive part of the story. Whether that uh, that you and this guy were able to apprehend him, or that uh, the police in Oregon actually showed up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was kind of surprised at how quick they got there. It only <laughs> took them about five minutes in a small town the size of Newport. So, anyway, wow. Yeah, then, about a mile after that, as I left the store, I'm still contemplating what went on there. A uh, guy wrecked a vehicle right in front of me, and I saw his dog get launched out of the passenger window as he's rolling back into the into the street, the oncoming traffic lane. And I'm thinking, what the hell is going on? It's been less than five minutes since I'm dealing with this last issue. And now this guy that just wrecked, seemed like he was like a fugitive or something because he tried to flee the scene in this totally destroyed vehicle that barely was driving. He starts driving away. His dog's on the side of the road. I pick up my phone. I pull over, put my hazards on, call 911, explain to them what's going on. Finally, the guy, I see him in my mirror, pull off to the side of the road. He's now walking back and he's not talking to people. And he kind of looked like he was, he was maybe a fugitive or something. So I lock my car as he's walking by. And finally, um, the ambulance came. He got his dog off the road. The dog was okay, luckily. It was it looked like a little pit bull or something. And uh, anyway, before they locked down the road and kept people from going, I had to get out of there. But it was basically two crazy incidences that happened within five minutes of each other within a mile there in Newport, Oregon. So that yeah, was a crazy Jesus. end to an awesome weekend. Man, those Coasties have always been unpredictable. Yeah, you, you got to be prepared. Don't <laughs> keep an eye on your six. You never know what's going to happen over there. <laughs> wow, crazy, man. And you were, uh, you. I saw that you posted a video of some king tides. What are the king tides? Tell me about that. Yeah, so the king tides are something I just learned about uh, recently. Um, this is when the um, moon and the sun get abnormally close to the earth. And so the gravitational pull that they put on the tides makes it pretty extreme and it can make the tidal exchange anywhere from eight to 12 feet. And I don't know if you're familiar with the tides, but normally, you know, the tide normal. Well, I am a, I am a fisherman. Yeah. So, you know, the tides normally, at least here (laughs) on the Oregon coast, (laughs) um, you could get anywhere from a foot to maybe six foot. And that six foot, you're like, boy, that's a pretty big exchange. So these were pretty high tidal exchanges and, of course, we went up there to do some scuba diving, and uh, during you know scuba diving, we actually were going up there to specifically spearfish. Speaking of fishing, oh, cool! But um, the that big of a tidal exchange makes for bad visibility. So 
We yeah, attempted our first is dive. Is it safe on, to oh, go ahead? Well, so. you have to. It's not necessarily safe to go unless you go right at slack tide. So you really have to check your tide tables and make sure that you're basically going underwater about 15 minutes from slack tide, knowing that you have about a 30 minute dive planned. And uh, so, anyway, it's not the end of the world, but the visibility was about one foot. So we attempted to do a dive and go spear fishing. And of course, the visibility didn't pan out for us. So we ended up spending the rest of the weekend just doing some touristy kind of stuff. We did a little bit of crabbing and that sort of thing. I did get some some video footage of the um, the waves crashing against that rocky wall that's there north of Newport and Depot Bay. Mm-hmm. And see that I posted a little a shot of that on my YouTube channel. If you want to check that out, that was pretty cool. And I'll also be releasing some more video footage of some King Tide events in the next coming weeks on my YouTube channel as well. So did you know that the King Tides were occurring and went, um, and went specifically to go see those or what? No, we, uh, we found out about them. We planned this trip like a couple months ago. And um, so once it got closer and I started seeing the news, I was like, well, we may not be able to dive, but you're going to the coast. So be cool to see. Scenario, you can see the King Tides, you can eat seafood, do the, the normal stuff, you know, that they've got there. They'll get some good restaurants and eat some good seafood. And, and the wax nice, museum. The wax museum. And, you know, hot toddies are always good uh, when it's crappy out. So, sure. You know, sure. That was always a lifesaver. So, yeah. Well, cool. Um, and you've, um, I guess we need to backtrack a little bit. Uh, we, uh, you, you got to tell us a fishing story too. Um, sure. So let's let let's hear let's hear one of those from the from the yeah, archives. Yeah, so I'll tell you um, probably one of my favorite fishing stories, and you know, as you know me, people may not, but I'm not really much of a fly fisherman. However, I do like fishing, uh, you know, trolling or ocean fishing and that kind of thing. And spear fishing too, which and spear is fishing, awesome which is actually like my favorite, because it talk combines more about here in a bit. But. Sure. Um, so anyway, uh, about eight years ago, eight to 10 years ago, I went on a fishing trip with my dad. We were actually in Newport, speaking of Newport. And uh, I went with an old high school friend of ours that you might remember. His name is Jeff Kulik. And uh, so we (laughs) we met my dad over there and he took us on a um, a halibut fishing trip out off the coast of Newport. So we get in his boat and we're heading out. It's me and my dad Anyway, so we're, we get on my dad's boat and we're heading out. You got to get where the spot we were going was uh, approximately, I think, about 11 miles off, basically from the boat ramp there at the marina in Newport. And we're going out, you know, and it takes a while because it's ocean going. And I'm guessing we're maybe 45 minutes to an hour into our trip out there. And my dad slows down the boat and he starts to panic a little bit and he he realizes he forgets all of the halibut fishing stuff back in the oh, truck. Jesus, Jack. I know, I know. So he, he's freaking out a little bit, and we're like, well, and he, you know, it's we're basically at that point, you got to turn around and go back, and you've missed the morning fish, or you got to come up with something. So, of course, you know, my dad, he, he says, well, I've read these magazines about how they fish for halibut up in Canada, and I just so happen to have that kind of gear on the boat. I got poles, got some weights. I got, I don't even remember exactly what the setup was, but my dad was basically the guide for me and, um, and Jeff that day. So we go out there and it was kind of a fishing competition between boats. My brother-in-law Rick uh, had a small crew on his boat and we had myself and my dad and Jeff on ours. And of course, Rick always, he thought he was going to smoke us with his, fishing abilities and so no, he's a fishy guy yeah so and we're like oh great well now we don't even have the right fishing gear and well as we got this something my dad read about in the magazine so we end up we get out there i think it was about 11 miles offshore and um we my dad sets up the poles um and he what we did if i remember right we were basically bouncing these the bait on we had like maybe uh I'm going to guess they were, I don't know how big the weights were. They were. Let's call them two ounce. Sure. They're pretty big. 
And we were basically, we let all of our line down. We're bouncing them off the bottom with the uh, bait. I don't, I don't remember exactly what we were using. It was herring, I think. You have some special concoction. You soak them in and you put them on there and you're bouncing them off the bottom. And sure enough, the first fish that we caught was a was a halibut. And it was a big one. We could tell just because of how much work and how long it took us to get us get it to the to the boat. When we finally got up there and we saw how big it was, we were blown away. This fish was almost the size of me, and I'm not a, a huge person, but you know, we're talking um this was a barn mass- door. And then uh yes. And then we realized as we were coming close, my dad's freaking out. He says, oh, man, I forgot the gaff. So I don't know how we're going to get this fish Jack. from the side of the boat into the thing. And I said, well, Dad, I don't know if it helps, but I have my 22 pistol in my backpack. And he looks around and he goes, well, you better grab it, Nick. I think we're going to need it. So I grabbed <laughs> my 22 pistol out of my backpack. We get this fish up. Is it the, the Bearcat? No, this was a... Uh, uh, Heritage right. Rough Rider. This was before Got we it. Right, right. Anyway, so he gets it up out of the water, the head just above the water, and he keeps yelling, watch the line, watch the line. And I pull back the hammer on that 22, and I start letting a rip on the head of this halibut, and I think I emptied four or five shots into it, and it was doing 360s at this point. And then it tur- after taking four shots to the head, it turned and just started diving down again, and, you know, the poles just zzzz. Going back in the water, we're like, holy cow, that thing's just took four 22 shots to the head and it's still going. And uh, it went down for a little bit and then finally it died and you could feel it go limp. And so we we reel it up and it took both um, Jeff and I with the big fishing net to reach over the side of the boat, get it and lift it into the boat. Somewhere I have a picture of it. I laid down next to on the bottom of the boat because I couldn't believe how big it was. and. When we finally got it back to the dock and we waited, it was 92 pounds. Holy so cow. For a Newport, Dang. Oregon halibut fish, it was the biggest fish caught on the docks that weekend that anybody had seen. Everybody was taking pictures of it when we got back. And we ended up with a couple other fish that weren't quite as big, but they were still big. So there was some about that method that we used or we just got super lucky. But, of course, we ended up winning the, uh, the little fishing derby between our camp and so we had a couple laughs and a few cocktails that night around the campfire to tell that story a few times. So that was that probably shut, one of my that shut Rick up for a while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, that's awesome! Cool. Leave it to Jack to figure that out. Oh yeah, exactly. So well, that's cool, man. Um, so you know, by trade, you've been an electrician for most of your life, um, but have always had multiple hobbies and aspirations from, you know, fishing to, to, you know, tooling around the desert and rattlesnake hunting and, and music. Uh, you've had, you know, heavy metal bands, you've had country bands, um, and then scuba diving, of course. Um, Mm -hmm. so, so how did you first become involved, um, with, with the group that, uh, that was dedicated to solving these missing person person's cases across the country um yeah how did that all how did that all come to pass so as you know you know i've been scuba diving for a long time but in the last 10 years anyway i got pretty active with it and i started doing a um, annual cleanup environmental cleanup operation that they had here locally in bend called the deschutes river cleanup project and this is um put on by the local watershed council um that they do annually every year. And what they do is they have a bunch of volunteers go down town. <clears throat> Most of it takes place in the old mill district here in Bend. And a lot of people uh, target the shorelines of the river to pick up trash and, and that sort of thing. But there's also a small group of local divers that volunteer their time to um, put in upstream of the old mill district and dive through there, cleaning up all the cans and bottles and any kind of garbage that gets put in. Of course, you you know you find a lot of sunglasses and cell phones and that sort of thing too. But it's basically just a, a trash cleanup operation that we do every year. And in Central Oregon, we have a fairly small scuba diving community because uh, for those of you that 
don't know, scuba diving is not super popular in the middle of the desert. <laughs> it's more <laughs> of something that goes on um, closer to the ocean, you know, places like Florida or places in the Caribbean and, and places like that. So if you are a scuba diver in Central Oregon, you tend to get to know all the other local scuba divers. So uh, about five years ago at one of those cleanup operations, I met another local um, scuba diver that was doing the same thing. And he had just happened to start a, a YouTube channel. And um, he said, hey, I'm doing these kind of all over and making some YouTube videos about it. Would you be interested in, in joining me for some of these? And of course, as scuba divers, you're always looking for some sort of entertainment. And if somebody's got a a project for you, it's it's like, heck yeah, let's do this. So we started uh, kind of doing some YouTube videos, more environmental cleanup stuff around the county, local stuff. And then it kind of got bigger and we would do some local lakes, you know, you know, Lake Billy Chinook. And after a while, we started finding some guns and different kind of stuff that the YouTube viewers uh, would notice that, you know, this stuff was pretty entertaining. And his YouTube channel built in numbers of subscribers, got a lot more views. And so we he got a few kind of sponsors and worked his way up to where now we wanted to travel a little farther. And so we started going up to Portland and um, doing vehicle recoveries out of the Willamette River. And uh, a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of uh, waterways around the country and I'm sure the world get filled with vehicles, most of which are either derelict vehicles that uh, a lot of them get stolen and eventually, you know, the stuff taken out of them and people dump them. Or a lot of it is insurance fraud where somebody will drive it down a boat ramp, put it in neutral, sink it, and tell their insurance company that it got stolen so they can collect on insurance if they're, you know, underwater on their payment, no pun intended. And, yeah, I've seen uh, two fishing guides do that. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whether on purpose or not, but, yeah, yeah. but they did it. <laughs> well, anyway, they, um, during the course of uh, one summer, this was maybe four, four and a half years ago now, of trying to recover as many vehicles as possible that we found in the Willamette River. Uh, one of those vehicles just happened to have a, um, a deceased person inside. And so once, once that happened, um, uh, my buddy's YouTube channel got a lot of attention and, and viewers reaching out to him saying, Hey, uh, we've got a lost loved one that was last seen in a vehicle in such and such place in the country. Do you think you can, help us out so that's when he kind of put together and started making it more of a focus on traveling around the country using sonar equipment and small zodiac rafts uh, with the intention of looking for missing people that also went missing in a vehicle neither of which have been found so um, they would go there and basically kind of draw a five to ten mile perimeter around their last known location and start searching the local waterways in the areas and um, and start finding these lost loved ones. And uh, to date in the last two and a half years, um, that particular uh, search team has found and solved 26 cold cases around the country uh, in states all over the country. So, um, you know, about four months ago is when I got hit up again um, by the owner of that organization saying, hey, uh, this thing's blowing up and I really need to, to cover some more ground. I want to put together a second team. And I, I think you'd be a great team leader for this. You, you've got the diving skills. You, you're experienced with um, working with the towing companies and law enforcement. You've got your military background and uh, you're, you're good with talking to people on camera. So do you think you'd be interested in doing this? So, of course, I said, yeah, absolutely. So that's when um, I started back in August of this year, 2022, and went on my first road trip, um, August 1st. And we were out for 30 days. I think we searched for about 17 different people on that particular road trip. Um, I think we hit if I remember right, about 
15 different states all the way as far east, northeast as up to Wisconsin, and then back down to California, and then back up to Oregon. Um, and then, as you know, on that particular road trip, we were about halfway into it, and uh, we were getting a lot of people hitting us up, uh, asking for our help down in the Truckee, California area, looking for a missing teenage girl named Kylie Rodney. And so um, we decided to kind of put some of our cases that we had scheduled on hold and leave directly from Wisconsin and come back to Truckee, California and see if we could help. And I, uh, I'm glad we did because um, on our second day of our search, we we found her in uh, Prosser Reservoir, approximately within a quarter mile of um, where she was last, her last known location was. So um, that was the first, my first uh, case that I solved. And um, I also dove on that vehicle to confirm that it was her vehicle and that uh, there were human remains inside. And um, yeah, we, um, that was something I didn't expect that kind of happened uh, kind of out of the, uh, out of the blue for me. And I really didn't expect all the media attention that that got because right before we found her, that case had gone kind of nationwide, made national news. And uh, so we instantly were into a kind of a media frenzy on that. And it was, um, it was a little overwhelming for me, to be honest with you. And uh, it's uh, still, it's been, you know, several months since we found her. The um, initial release from the investigators has come out saying that just it's an accident with no explanation as to. Really? Yeah. That's where it's, that's where it's left at? Yeah. There's no explanation as to why. So there's a lot of people still um, speculating and, you know, I, I don't like to talk about it too much, but you can, this isn't private information. This is all over the internet and, and YouTube channels all over, you know, talking about potential of cover-ups and foul hmm. play and sure. police covering it up. And I mean, you, you Scientology, Freemasons. I mean, every rumor you can probably <laughs> imagine is out there. So the stone cutters, um, everybody. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's gotten a little bit out of hand to be honest with you. Um, to this day, you know, that video that we made, um, that's still on YouTube. You can watch that and make your own assumption. And people ask me, do you still think it's suspicious? And yes, I do. That's about all I can say. Just the whole circumstances and the fact now that the police can just come forward and say, well, we've determined it's an accident without any explanation as to hmm. how, uh, bothers me a little bit, but I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not the investigator. I, my job was to find where it's not my job to find out why. So I have to let that go. Well, this is the same outfit that spent 90,000 man hours looking for this, uh, for this vehicle underwater, right? Yeah. I think it was nine over 9,000 man hours. 9,000. Okay. <laughs> it's still several different, yeah. Several different agencies yeah. and they had already searched Prosser reservoir and um, you know, after two weeks of her being missing and <clears throat> uh, we came in and actually the, the first day that we were on site, we didn't search um, Prosser Reservoir because the police that we talked to made us pretty convinced that they'd cleared it. You know, it was pretty, hmm. we were pretty confident that she wasn't there. So we spent our first day searching Boca Reservoir and Donner Reservoir, which are a couple other lakes that are in the nearby vicinity. And um, we didn't find her there, so it was the second day. We thought, well, let's let's start at square one and just go by the old saying, you know, hey, if we haven't searched it, it hasn't been searched, because people can tell you till they're blue in the face, but unless you see it with your own two eyes, how are you going to know that it got searched to your standard? You see, yeah. using sonar is not something that's necessarily taught to a specific standard. In the grand scheme of things, I think it's still fairly a new technology that, you know, I'm not knocking any law enforcement. In fact, 
they don't have the resources really to do what we did. They to look for a person underwater in a vehicle. That's something that they may see once every 10 years. And mm-hmm. so there's probably very few law enforcement agencies and or uh, agents that have actually searched for a missing vehicle underwater. Whereas our outfit did that day in and day out. So you get pretty good at what you do if that's all you're doing every day. Um, right. So, you know, I'm not blaming them. I, I do. Uh, I do think that there needs to be a better system in place nationwide and quite frankly, probably worldwide to teach these local agencies how to use sonar better, how to be better equipped for a missing person in a vehicle. And, and I'm, I'm actually in the process of trying to figure out a way that I can help maybe go around and help train these agencies to uh, use their sonar better and, and maybe try to put some sort of protocols in place. So when a person becomes missing and they don't find them, here's the, the protocol that we would do. Here's how you should do it too. Yeah. Interesting that, uh, that the Coast Guard doesn't have um, some sort of um, team that, uh, that is, you know, devoted to that. You know, and the Coast Guard may, I don't know necessarily, I, I still got some research I'd like to do, and that's a good point, um, to see if the Coast Guard is strictly only used on, you know, federally navigable waters. Right. Um, and not that, that, That's probably lakes. the case, yeah. Right. Um, but either, nonetheless, if they have the capabilities to do it, you would think that um, we could call them in. Or what about the National Guard? I was a member of the National Guard for nine years. We did lots of stuff to help the communities. We work on wildfires, floods, um, you know, all kinds of riots. They they should be trained or at least have the backup ability to do all kinds of stuff like that. And so, you know, there's, I just think that there should be some more, more resources available to the general public for these types of situations where a person goes missing in a vehicle. And if, if they can't find them in the immediate search, they just kind of throw up their hands and, Say we don't have any more evidence to go on, so we're we're kind of done. Yeah, man. Um, well, uh, yeah, that was interesting because you you uh, swung by here, um, dropped by my house real quickly on your way out for this initial road trip, I believe, um, yes. with that outfit. And uh, you know, it was really cool. You showed me uh, the trailer with all of the gear. You had the film crew there. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, off you went. And then a week later, you were on the CBS Evening News. Um, yeah. And you mentioned that it was a little bit overwhelming. But uh, but can you kind of go into depth a little bit about what that media firestorm was like? Like what level of attention sure. were you getting personally? I mean, were people hoarding you on the street? Like, yeah, what was so- it like? Yeah. So, you know, I first got a warning about it. We actually, the day we found Kylie, we had um, on site with us a reporter from the um, New York Post or I think it was the New York Post or something like that. And he was just doing a story on our our search. And we we get that a lot of times. People would show up and they would want to interview us and just kind of follow us along for the day. And um when we found her, we had to um, actually one of my coworkers actually confiscated his phone from him to make sure that the the feeding frenzy didn't start sooner than it should, and um, <clears throat> which I'm glad they did. But at the end of the day, he he was a really nice guy, and he gave me a warning. He said, "Hey, just so you know, your phone's about to blow up from all kinds of strange numbers of reporters going to be reaching out to you for an interview." And I said, well, I don't understand. How do they, how are they going to get my number? And he says, it's the, it's the paparazzi. They have, there's websites and there's, they have the resources. They will get your cell phone number. They will personally reach out to you. And sure enough, about an hour after that, my phone started getting texts, phone calls. I started getting emails from random people saying, hey, I'm so-and-so with whatever media outlet. So that afternoon, I had already been hit up by, you know, 10 to 15 different media outlets across the nation. And, uh, you know, we'd been asked several times to, to do interviews. And, of course, that the, obviously the first day we just kind of stood back and let the – once we found Kylie and let law enforcement take over, it was kind of their 
their crime scene at that point, and we just kind of stood outside and watched it. And um, the, the next two days, the acting CEO of the company at the time basically scheduled all of our media uh, interviews. And so the very next day we had, if I remember right, about 12 interviews back to back. So my coworker and I, um, that were basically the two head guys of that search team at the time did one after another. I mean, we were on, um, you know, good morning America or the today show, one of those, and you know, all the other news outlets that you can think of. And, um, some of them were pre-recorded. Most of them were live. So we, uh, Dang. one of the team members had a, uh, a family member that had a cabin in the Lake Tahoe area. So we posted up there for a couple of days to decompress and kind of, um, clean our gear and reorganize for the rest of the trip. And, uh, we did multiple interviews. We just basically had a laptop set up and one after another, we just did these live streams and, um, it was, it was almost more tiring than it was to go out and search all day and lift boats in and out, to be honest with you. Uh, um, so it was, it was an eye opener. I, I couldn't believe the amount of media attention that that particular case would have collected at the time and it it went on for obviously that the first day was was all the major news networks and then we all including myself got hit up by emails of different youtube channels and wanting to do hey can we get you as a guest on our show and this and that sort of thing and i still get hit up occasionally it's it's kind of waned from that quite a bit but i, I still occasionally get hit up by people that are asking me to to talk about it and well, yeah. What's this? I mean, this is, you know, despite all that, you were more right. nervous for this podcast than any of those uh, live oh, interviews. Yeah, sure. yeah. This is nerve wracking. <laughs> this is big time. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. crazy. So like you were, could you explain the experience of like being interviewed by, by Lester Holt? Like, um, sure. just kind of so, take me through like the dressing or, you know, like kind of the whole process. Like that's sure. So interesting. Um, I wished I would have actually got to talk to Lester Holt. I'm a big fan of his, but. Um, oh, it was, it was the of, Lester, the evening news with Lester Holt, but somebody else. I, yeah, that's he's right. I saw the, main, the interview. I knew yeah, that. He's yeah, He's kind of a main commentator, but then he has his like correspondents that do the little interviews right. or whatever. So they, they basically schedule it and they send you a link to the stream yard, whatever. And you get on there and then they kind of, you're backstage and you get to watch the news going on on part of the screen and then they'll have a guy kind of backstage occasionally that would chime in and say, okay, we're going to take one more commercial break and then he'll do an interview and then you'll be coming on after that. And so, you know, obviously when you first enter the backstage part of it, they check and make sure that your, um, your shot is okay and that your sound levels are all good. And they'll say, Hey, do you think you can tilt the camera a little bit to the, to down a little bit that, we don't want to see the wind of the glare on the windows too much or whatever. So you'd have to tweak it a little bit and then they would say, okay, the sound's a little weird and they may have to tweak it and then, okay, just stand by. And then they'll you'd be watching. And like I said, they'll come on and say, okay, they're going to do one more commercial break. And then you're going to come on right after the introduction. And then it's just boom. And it's live. live. It's wow. live. And they ask you the questions and you, you have to give the answer right then and there. You don't get, there's no editing involved in it because it's 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 live news and I'm, I'm gonna guess we did six or eight of those the the day after we found her and I, I imagine probably by the seventh and eighth one you you've had your routine down pretty well pat yeah i mean obviously most questions of the questions differed a little are, bit but yeah. yeah but they're pretty much similar you know what they're gonna say so you yeah towards the end of the day you're just like okay one more and then let's go we, i'm hungry i want to eat something so Dang. So you probably turned down a lot of offers to appear on various YouTube channels and what have you. And like, yeah. Yes. And, you know, honestly, I like um, nowadays, I, if somebody sends me an, an email and they are super nice and polite and I check out their channel and I see that they're not a person that just bashes everybody. Troll. Yeah. Um and they're kind of a smaller channel. I, I like going on those because I, I kind of think it's fun to help out the, the smaller channels. I mean, a month ago, I had uh, 
shoot, I mean, three weeks ago, I had like 1,200 subscribers on my YouTube channel. And then I posted a couple new YouTube videos. And now I just hit 29,000 subscribers. So I know That's what it's lot, like man. to be a small yeah. person and anything helps. So I try to help out the small channels and give them a little something. And I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a nobody, but if somebody wants to talk about a specific thing, there's certain things I'm more than happy to share with people. Obviously, there's certain things I can't go into detail about right now. But uh, if that's the case and they ask a question, I can just say, hey, I can't really talk about that right now. So I'm more than happy to well, talk about lots of stuff. So you say you're a nobody. That's not true. But you are just uh, you are uh, an, an average dude who has um, always, um, you know, kept your dreams in sight. So despite um, the rigors of everyday work and, you know, you have a, a career, a, you know, a long-standing career that you can always fall back on that you've spent, you know, decades building, um, but you've yet you've always, you know, kind of had your sights set somewhere else for yourself. And, um, you know, just uh, as your friend, I'm just super happy for you. And, uh, and uh, I think it's inspirational that you've never lost sight of those dreams and goals and you know here i have an autographed photo of you leading a rock band 20 some years ago and uh and we'll post that up here um so folks can see it but uh you know i believe it says um uh those who uh don't reach for the top never reach their goal you know yes, um and that's true i mean it was yeah, kind no. of a joke back then but but it's right, true no, uh yeah and i appreciate it um yeah it's just one of those things where and i would say this to anybody is i don't care how old you are or how small you are you can still do big things in this world and the only way to do that is to keep looking forward and never give up on your dreams and goals and always try to better yourself continuing education i don't care what you're doing even if you're a fly fishing guide a fly fisherman to think that you've reached the top and there's no more for you to learn or nowhere else to go to get to another level, you know, you can't think like that. You have to always be looking for the next piece of information or the next opportunity to move to that next level. And uh, again, the main thing is just never let go of your dreams and your passions. Always stick with your passions because those will lead you to the direction your heart desires. That's the main thing right there. Well said. Well said. Um, I'd like to talk about spearfishing a little bit. Um, sure. I'm su super curious about it. I went f one time for approximately 15 minutes and uh, there was a, uh, a tiger shark sighting in the Bahamas and we got the hell out of there. Um, but uh, so I've always been kind of uh, interested in it, curious about it. Uh, you spearfish in much different environments than I probably would like the uh, gloomy, dark, eerie, murky, great white, freaking infested Oregon coast. So um, tell me a little bit about like the spearfishing experience and what that's all about. Sure. So um, here in the, and by the way, I've also done it, excuse me, right. I've also you, done it in you um, go tropical too. Yeah. But the, the spearfishing you do down in the Caribbean is for lionfish. And I don't know if you know much about that. That's cool, man. Yeah, let's hear about fish. that too. <clears throat> Good point. Yeah, I'll start there. The lionfish, um, for those of you that don't know, are an evasive species that has been a problem for, uh, I think, a, a few decades now. Um, and they are, there's nothing that really, there's not many, I wouldn't say nothing, but there's not many ocean creatures that eat the lionfish. So they're spreading faster than they can get killed off. And so they're, they're becoming a, um, a nuisance in a lot of areas, um, mainly in the, the warmer waters of the ocean, not necessarily over here in the Pacific. So the lionfish, you can Google this or you can check them out there. They have these, they're beautiful fish, actually. They have these spines that come off them that actually are poisonous. So you have to be real careful when you're spearfishing for them. And, but when you go to places like the Caribbean, Bonaire, Curacao, um, those kind of places you can sign up to go on these guided lionfish hunts and they kind of run you through a little briefing on how to do it. Then you go out and of course down there you can see for a hundred feet, the water's warm 
it's uh it's super easy diving and if you get lionfish most of the time you can um take them to the local resort you're staying at to the to the restaurant or the kitchen and they'll cook them up for you and they're actually it's by far the best fish i've ever eaten i'm not even joking ask anybody who's eating the lionfish it's better than halibut cod salmon any of that it's absolutely melt in your mouth delicious so if you ever get the chance go on a little guided lionfish spear hunt next time you're in that area is it so, better than like an old carp on the bank in the summertime that's been sitting there for a while? Well, it's not quite as good as that, but, um, you know, okay. it's, it's a close second. <laughs> um, so, but most of the spear fishing that I do is here at the Oregon coast. And basically you just have to have the same fishing license you do if you're fishing with a pole above the water. And we normally go off of the jetty fingers we've uh newport's probably the most popular place that i go we also sometimes go down to port orford which is even better but port orford's pretty town it's a six hour drive versus three hours that's why we most of the time go to newport so um there's a couple different types of uh methods you can use for that so you got your some people call them hawaiian slings or some people call them pole spears and it's basically like a four to five foot long fiberglass rod with a three pronged uh, metal tip on it. And then it's got a surgical tubing strap on the back that you put your hand in and to cock it, you basically just with your right hand or whatever hand you're, I'm right handed. So my right hand, I put it between my uh, forefinger and my thumb and you push it down there. So you get it real tight and you hold kind of the, top part of the pole spear and you get within three feet of the fish and you point it at them and you release with your right hand and the the um, strap basically the sling just shoots it forward and you can get it that way now you can use barbed hooks or unbarbed hooks um, both have their uh, advantages and disadvantages the three the barbed hooks are good because you once you get it it's not going anywhere it can't get off the hook. You can easily now grab the fish if it's still alive or whatever, pull it off the hook and put it on your um, slingaling is what we call them, where you put it through the gills and strap it to your BCD and keep going. But the downside of the, the barbed hooks is when you pull the fish off, it can damage the meat a little bit there. So on my pole spear, I use the unbarbed hook so it doesn't damage the meat. But now the disadvantage of that is when you spear the fish, you got to follow it up and either poke it and hold it into the ground or up against a rock while you can get a hold of it with your other hand, pull it off the hook to get it onto your slingling. And sometimes you may have to pull your dive knife out and stick it through the eye and spin it so that it basically kills it right away. And then you um, don't have to worry about it swimming off after it's wounded. So that's the method that most people prefer, and it's kind of the beginner level. That's what I prefer. Um, once you get the hang of using either the, the pole spear or, or if you want to call it the Hawaiian sling, then a lot of people will step up to an actual spear gun. They make these in all different styles and lengths, and the spear gun will shoot farther, so there are some advantages to it. You don't have to get as close to the fish uh, to get a shot. But the disadvantage of a spear gun is there's a safety factor. So you basically have to swim around with this cocked spear gun with a spear in it. And you got to be careful of your surroundings and your dive buddy. So you don't accidentally hit that trigger because there really isn't a safety. And you don't want that spear to go off into your buddy or into yourself. And you can look at YouTube videos for days of people accidentally spearing themselves. So. Um, you got, you know what I'm saying? You got to be a little careful with that setup. So I like actually, it needs a hunter safety course attached to it. It totally does. And then, like I said, they're, they look easy with somebody that's experienced with them, but I have one. And when I first used it, I didn't go very long. And I was like, man, I'm, this is, I'm not, this isn't my comfort zone yet. I want to get good with this pole spear because it's a little bit more manageable, safer, and it's, it's fairly easy. I mean, you got to remember spear fishing. The, the thing I like about it, especially for rockfish on the Oregon coast, is you can limit out in 30 minutes. 
because you're it's, it's like shooting fish in a barrel because you really you really are you're swimming right up to them they'll let you get close you pick the biggest ones and you there's several different kind you know you got your black sea bass perch you got uh hmm. lings ling cod of course that's what you're mainly going for those are the prize harder um, to find yeah harder to find but that's like what you're mainly going for um and, and you I shoot think, cabazon too yeah now cabazon aren't legal all the time right but they are uh depending you have to check the local um regulations and they post signs normally at the local marina there in newport which we always drive down there pick up a synopsis read the the current uh warnings for hey this one's off limits right now so you know because um you know above water is different when you're underwater and the visibility is bad things look uh you lose a lot of color when you lose sunlight and so it's fish identification gets a little more complicated when you're underwater so it takes a little bit of practice and then the other thing that takes a little bit of practice and judgment is the size of them. For instance, a, a lingcod, I believe in Oregon has to be a minimum of, I think it's 22 inches. Well, when you're underwater, things look yeah. way bigger than normal. So you look at a lingcod, oh, wow, there's a huge lingcod. I'm going to shoot it and you shoot it. And then you finally come out of the water and realize it's not even legal. So what we do to prevent that from happening is we measure our pole spears and put a piece of tape at 22 inches or whatever the, the minimum is around it. So you can kind of hold something out in front of you and use that as a size reference to see if it's legal. And we also, mm. we also do that with, we do underwater crabbing as well. And so you, on a retractable device, you take the little crab measuring device. So when you pick up a crab, you can measure it right then and there. And if it's not big enough, you just throw it down. If it's big enough, then you can put it in your mesh bag and keep going. There is a, I do have a short video I filmed back in 2015 on my YouTube channel that shows some underwater shots of me and my buddy James, who I think you met once, spearfishing um, in Port Orford and Newport. I think I mixed both of those, but there's some good shots of um, them. And again, you can limit out in 30 minutes, come out of the water, and you, you and your friends can have delicious, fresh seafood right there on the shore with a glass of wine. It's awesome. That sounds epic, man. Um... Well, awesome, Nick. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Um, Nick's YouTube channel is just Nick Wren, right? Yep, that's it. Just Nick Wren, and uh, you can follow him on Instagram at Rattlesnake Wren. And um, yeah, man, uh, just great catching up with you. And thanks again for taking the time and um, congrats on, uh, on all your success and wishing you continued uh, success in your future endeavors. Go to the FebruaryRoom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns, and if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at the FebruaryRoom.com. The February Room is always free. But if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.